Um, so welcome to the Fulbright Oxford Future of Human Rights series. Today's talk will be um, the theme of migration. And I want to thank Humber College, the Department of Politics and International Relations, uh, the Fulbright Program for all sponsoring this, and of course, my guests, Professor Stephen May and Lauren Landau, uh, both in some sense at Oxford and in some sense in <laughs> other places, <laughs> um, living embodiments of the migratory spirit <laughs> and transnational academic exchange. Um, and as I guess only one of you knows from the previous sessions, um, yeah, I don't have to worry about repeating myself so much this time. Um, the concept of the series is based on a book that came out in 2018, right before we began planning what was supposed to be a 2020 visit to discuss the future of human rights. And in that book, I had outlined what I saw as trends uh, in the study of human rights and um, kind of key emerging issues and places where the human rights regime needs to really think through uh, possibilities and limitations. Um, since that time, of course, I was delayed in coming here by the pandemic, but that gives us an opportunity to reflect further on these issues, to update, um, and in many cases to examine some further challenges. Um, and um, the good news is that the series was planned as a dialogue with UK counterpart researchers and um, in each session, and it was going to be one, but as you see, it's grown and enriched. And so um, over the past four weeks, we've had a, a growing dialogue, um, and um, it's, I think, a very productive thing. And then for people who can't be here, uh, we do have the recording, the recording is posted, on the Pembroke site, we circulate it um, on Twitter, and we're actually getting some more feedback that way as well. And eventually, there'll be some sort of publication reflecting this further dialogue in these key areas. Um, so, um, for those of you that that uh, may, just to keep track, um, the issues that we've looked at so far are women's rights um, and. Um, uh, accountability and the struggle for justice. Uh, last week we looked at and um, uh, human rights education and uh, the use of media in promoting human rights. Today we're looking at migration, migrants' rights, and then uh, next week we will look at global governance and new possibilities for global institutions and processes to regulate human rights. Um, so again, the concept of the series is to look at the dilemmas planted in the future of human rights books uh, and then to go on and examine work that I've done over my career in each of these issue areas and then to add the work that the speakers have done and that's the order in which we're going to look. So these are um, my books. Um, the middle one is my own volume, Human Rights and Private Wrongs, that looks at human rights violations by non-state actors, and that's where I began to think about issues like human trafficking. And the other two are edited collections, where um, I am drawing from the contributors' case-based research um, from human trafficking to human rights, that's obvious, and uh, People Out of Place, which was about different kinds of displacement and where we talked about the citizenship gap, my, my co-editor and I, Gershon Shapir. So um, the first thing, so the first couple of slides are simply to rehearse the framework that was established in the Future of Human Rights books, uh, book, I keep saying books, um, maybe I'm thinking toward the second volume, <laughs> the revised edition. Um, so um, one uh, conceptual uh, contribution I, I, I attempted in that work was to intervene in some of the debates about 
human rights uh, as after a generation of human rights scholarship, right? We've had 20, 30 years now of people looking academically from law, political science, sociology, and, and other fields. Um, and um, a lot of debate on what human rights really is and really should be. Um, and so I take a broad view and say that human rights is, at the same time, a normative ethos, um, an institutional regime, and that uh, while that is certainly based in law to some extent, it's a broader toolbox that includes law, treaties, policies, state agencies, and other things. Um, a political strategy, mainly of social movements, but the various kinds of actors claiming and advocating for rights. Um, and I think we'll hear more about law and lawyers and legal um, strategic litigation campaigns. It provides a, a global lingua franca, so we now have a common vocabulary to talk about things like war crimes. We may not agree whether they've occurred in a given situation, but there, there is now an established common sense about what human rights are, um, and that is a factor in world politics, um, and a practice of social movements. Um, and in terms of trying to uh, bridge different sorts of debates about whether human rights are too much, too little, um, you know, too narrow, too Western, too elite, uh, too challenging to state sovereignty. These are, scholars have, have claimed all of these things. Um, and I say, you know, the problem is, if we revisit this, that human rights are not the answer. We're trying to find human rights as the answer. Rather, a kind of, for those of you more philosophically inclined and more constructivist, pragmatist sort of view, is that rights are not the answer, rights are the question. And rather, if we read up um, from the history and practice of human rights, we find that human rights are an ongoing social practice that attempts to answer three kinds of questions. Who is human? What is right? And who is responsible? Um, and so, you know, the ethos, who is human, but that's also how we see struggles for citizenship, inclusion, race, gender, other sorts of social status issues. Um, what is right, which is where we are seeing increasing evolution of technological social conditions, including things like health crisis, and then who is responsible, which is the both normative and political question, and legal. Um, and that's the cover of the future of human rights there in the corner. Um, the other sort of move I make in the book the future of human rights uh, that we want to revisit is that uh, in order to, again, bridge or intervene in debates about human rights being at an end times, as someone who I believe visited here a couple of years ago, Samuel Moy, contributes to this extremely harshly skeptical view of the potential of human rights, and then we have a much more optimistic view of a justice cascade that Catherine Sickling advocates, and there are two or three other names on each side of those debates. Um, and I say, you know, they're in a sense both right, um, and, but uh, actually human rights are the crossroads and are simultaneously expanding and contracting in different degrees. And um, overall, we see an expanding set of principles and an expanding potential for process, more processes and venues um, but we see contracting implementation and contracting responsibilities and increasing undermining of previously established responsibilities. And this is where the tension is. And this is where particular issues um, pull on those tensions and need to be particularly addressed. Certain populations, certain mm -hmm. kinds of rights and claims um, that, that fall in that tension. Um, and so uh, there's a broader set, uh, a, a broader set of lists of where the expansion is, where the contraction is, and I'm going to outline them right now, but in each of the issue sessions, we concentrate on a few. Um, we can't discuss them all at once. So overall, there are, green is good, red is bad, right? <laughs> there are new claims and frames about what is right 
um, and new claims and frames for everything from environmental justice to femicide, labeling things in ways that, that elicit more attention and response. Uh, there are new voices and spaces in the international regime, for example, indigenous peoples have forums and, and settings. Um, uh, we're not going to look so much at those with the issue of migration, and in fact, there's little development in those ways for the issue of migration. But we will look at some new mechanisms and expansions of the repertoire, I think, particularly Professor Mayer's presentation. Um, and then in other domains, there are different kinds of norm change, different kinds of coalitions emerging. That's the positive side. The negative side is that uh, in the future book, I identify certain systematic gaps, hardwired, built into the human rights system. One is the citizenship gap, um, that as Hannah Arendt originally worried, even though we have universal international human rights, ultimately the delivery system is the state and membership in a state and recognition as a citizen becomes a constraint. And this, of course, is absolutely critical for the issue of migration. Um, we have a security gap that the state retains sovereignty and monopoly of force. Uh, and we have a globalization gap in terms of responsibilities that when things are crossing borders and not governed by a state, we also, we have sort of at both ends of the spectrum, state power is a problem. <laughs> uh, the state has too much and too little power. Um, and then we have all these, you know, backlash issues. Okay, so that's the framework of the future of human rights and why we're looking at these issues and what conceptual things we need to address in order to uh, perhaps make some progress. Uh, the, I do two other things in each session. Um, I, uh, for the purposes of my own advancement, uh, and also to sort of update that framework, I survey a little bit what is some recent scholarship, what kinds of issues are being raised in the past five to ten years um, in human rights scholarship about this issue. So in terms of the role of migration and rights, where do we see the scholarship? First of all, um, and, and I'll say that in this session, in other sessions, there's sort of a particular debate. It may be that I'm just not aware of what I see when I look at migration, when I look at my contributors to these edited volumes and I kind of do a literature search, um, I really see more just focusing on different issues, not so much an organized debate where there's a principle and should we do it this way or that way. Um, uh, so I see an increasing focus on refugees. What is a refugee? What's the difference between a refugee, asylum seeker, and internally displaced person? Um, and the uh, critique of disparate asylum assessment processes in different countries, even liberal democracies that accept human rights. Um, I see a, a, a big debate in the lags in the uh, long established principle of non refoulement that's not returning someone to a zone of danger, that is in, baked into the original concept of refugees, and yet it is uh, very widely violated and doesn't seem really attended by the system. I'd be interested to see what you think about that. Um, we see an increasing focus on the growing phenomenon of trafficking and exploitative labor migration of different kinds. Um, we see um, also uh, a parallel focus on due process and, again, even states that participate in the refugee regime or in the asylum regime or in any kind of migration regime still regularly undermine, violate, and are extremely inconsistent in their assessment and there doesn't seem to be an established principle of the process, not just the standard, it's the process also varies a lot. You know, if you're Australian, you just dump them on islands. I mean, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Um, and um, uh, then in terms of, um, you know, thinking harder about um, contesting and who is human and how we get people included, that there is a lot more attention to gendered vulnerability. Starts with attention to trafficking, but for all in all forms of migration, re women as refugees, um, the, the intersection of gender with uh, refugee and migration status. 
and the impact of migration on social rights in frontline states, that is, the states that are taking most migrants and refugees um, that are suffering tremendously in their ability to provide the most basic services for their own citizens. And I think uh, Professor Landa is going to uh, tell us more about that. Um, so just, I think, one or two more words on my own take on these things in my previous work that will then build up with more recent and dedicated work. Um, so in that People Out of Place volume where we started talking about the citizenship gap, uh, these are, that's over 10 years old, that's um, yeah, 15, 17 years old. So um, uh, this is now, I think, conventional wisdom in migration studies, but this, these were the things we sort of discovered as we went along in that. Um, that, you know, migration is not uh, just a sort of a social problem or an economic issue um, or, or a cultural issue. It's really about power relations. It's about push, pull, and networks. Um, that rights abuses are usually what push people out of place. That, um, you know, even what we call economic migration is usually a lack of some kind of social rights, if not political persecution in the formal sense. Um, that the citizenship gap makes people vulnerable in both transit and host countries, um, and that weak and predatory states and the globalization gap facilitate predatory networks. So trafficking is uh, a, a set of vulnerabilities and abusive actors at several levels. States are not off the hook here. This is not just crime. Um, um, and that migrants are socially situated and act in response to family and community pressures, that, that uh, these overly individualized models of migration are quite misleading. Um, uh, and of course, a lack of accountability and leverage for non-state private wrongs brings us to trafficking, which is the migration issue upon which I have most concentrated in my own previous research. Um, the first thing that I encountered and I started working on uh, researching human trafficking about 15 years ago um, and have several times is the tremendously distorted framing of sex trafficking and the distorted imagery. Um, you know, the, the, it's a minority of the number. Of course, it is a terrible thing. Um, but it, uh, that distorts and reflects a kind of global exceptionalism. And then even if we want to look at the gendered vulnerability of women in migration, we need to look at things like women's um, exploited migration for domestic labor, the so-called maid trade. We need to look at women in sweatshops um, and borderland environments who are, by the way, also often sexually exploited and harassed. Um, so prostitution and sex work is really only a very small part of that exploitive, irregular labor migration. Um, and um, migration and exploitation both are spectrums, not binaries. The law is created as if they are binaries. In fact, there, are, uh, there is a breakdown um, in, as if it ever truly existed in this distinction between forced migration, humanitarian displacement, chronic violence, so-called survival migration in response to poverty, climate or development displacement, um, and the level of exploitation people face in their source environment, the smuggling situation, and the host environment. Um, and we really need to look across that spectrum at all of those rights problems if we want to get a handle on this. Not easy, but this was what has come up again and again. Um, and, um, you know, to look at the structural imbalances, not just in terms of um, political economy, rightslessness in the sense of what country you live in, what environment you come from, violence that's happening, your economic position, but the intersections, of course, with race, class, gender, caste. Um, and so, um, you know, again, this overly individualized, somewhat um, negatively romanticized view of human trafficking, of young girls being hit over the head and dragged across the border is simply inaccurate. 
Um, and I wish I could suppress every Liam Neeson movie. Um, he's done so much harm <laughs> to responsible consciousness of human trafficking. Um, and in fact, in many, uh, even when we are looking at gender trafficking, and even when we're looking at sex trafficking, in many situations, families are complicit, or certainly social networks are complicit, or there is a semi-voluntary decision lacking better options. Um, and um, we have also, particularly in the Middle Eastern countries, we have systems where states um, have regulated migration in a way where employers hold the person's passport, this permits, and um, actually facilitates tremendous exploitation. Um, and um, again, that, that intersection that in every environment of trafficking or labor exploitation I have ever known of, um, there is a systematic uh, stark relationship between uh, race or caste and vulnerability to trafficking and labor exploitation. Um, in, in India, the, uh, the data is just stunning in terms of the uh, caste status and the level of vulnerability to trafficking. Um, and in India also, that trafficking is also um, often linked in several dimensions to child marriage. We think of marriage as an alternative to trafficking, and in fact, they are often linked as means of exploitation. So that's enough good news um, for me. <laughs> uh, no, um, so these are you know some of the issues I've looked at, and um, I think we're now going to turn to um, refugees and Professor. Manning, if you'd like to shift to see the screen, that's an option. Um, or we can just fine. okay, good, 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 excellent. Thanks, Allison, uh, and uh, to Pembroke and the other sponsors of the series. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to all of you for for coming. Uh, I'll say a word about myself and how I came to be interested in, in the issue of migration. Um, I am a professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, though I also teach in the Human Rights uh, Summer School here here at Oxford. Um, and I focus on the rights of non-citizens in my research, particularly asylum seekers uh, and refugees. So I have a scholarly approach, but also a practical approach because I also supervise a, a clinic at uh, Minnesota where we represent students, uh, represent asylum seekers and trafficking uh, survivors. Um, and so I also take a practical approach to things that I'm interested in the lawyers to do this kind of work, what motivates them <clears throat> and their strategies for um, enforcing the rights of, of uh, asylum seekers, refugees, and trafficking survivors. Uh, a couple of things to, to preface my remarks, I'm going to pick up on something that Allison said about the lack of debate um, uh, about migration. Um, I think that's that's largely true with respect to my um, lawyers uh, and legal scholarship on this issue. For the most part, the, the, the idea is that the focus is on how can we more effectively enforce the law, which of course is what lawyers are interested in. Um, and I plead guilty to that too. And what I'm going to talk about for a bit today is, is some of the strategies that, that lawyers in some refugee receiving nations are utilizing uh, more prominently in recent years. Um, but there is some pushback, and Lauren is a great example of this, and, and um, that maybe we ought to look beyond the law in, in enforcing uh, the rights and vindicating the rights of, of refugees and asylum seekers. So we, and we actually, in, in, in designing the, our remarks for today, thought consciously about, uh, if not a debate, at least a discussion about that, and where might we, where might we go, because I certainly acknowledge uh, the limitations of the international refugee law regime. And so that's what I want to talk about. And then that'll, that'll lead into um, Lauren's remarks. So the roadmap for my part of the session uh, is uh, it actually starts with the past. We're talking about the future of human rights, but many, many times the, uh, a robust discussion of the, the future, you have to have a discussion of the past. So I'll talk a little bit about how that international um, refugee law regime has developed over the past century, 
I'll talk about the limitations on that regime. And I'll switch to my current research about how lawyers in a few um, refugee receiving nations have adapted to those limitations and tried to work around them. I'll talk about the limitations that they've encountered um, in, in, in innovative approaches. And then that will lead to Lauren's discussion about, well, maybe we might want to look at this from a different perspective. Um, so the, the history of the international refugee law regime. Um, uh, migration was really not the subject of international law attention before World War I. Um, prior to that, most migrations across national borders were relatively small. They often occurred in under, underdeveloped or undeveloped regions. They were a matter of state concern, certainly, in terms of the, the, the states that were absorbing those migrations. Um, but the international community did not see fit to um, deal with it in any organized way. That all changed with the two world wars in the 20th century, where we had millions of, of uh, refugees. Um, and uh, that resulted in a number of measures, but most prominently, the 1951 Refugee Convention. Um, and um, it is, it what certainly was and remains the main source of international refugee protection. So it's, it's had that status for 70 years. Um, now, the most important part of the Refugee Convention, certainly for the purposes of enforcing um, uh, or establishing that someone uh, meets the criteria of a refugee is, is the definition, which, I, which is on the slide that, that you see. Um, and this, uh, if someone meets this definition, then they are entitled to the other protections that the Refugee Convention includes, such as housing, public education, public benefits, um, and ultimately, in many countries, a pathway to citizenship. Um, so one thing, and just sort of definitionally, and because sometimes these terms get blurred, a refugee is someone who has met this definition, okay? And uh, either uh, in, when, when they're outside the country of refuge, usually in a refugee camp, and they're given that designation, and then they eventually get to their, to their host country, or um, they are folks who have traveled to the country of refuge, and then that country's state apparatus has deemed that they've satisfied this definition and then they, they become refugees. Until that time, then they are generally known as asylum seekers, i.e. they're seeking asylum. Once they are found to have uh, met this definition, then they become refugees. Okay, so I've put in bold the, what, what I think are the key, part, the, the key part of this, which is the standard that must be met. Uh, that is that someone has a well-founded fear of being persecuted or reasons of, and there's five key categories here, race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, uh, or political opinion. Um, can we, are, are we allowed to ask questions uh, in this yeah. case? My question would be, because this is very much a creature, of course, of the time and place where it was um, uh, drafted in 1951, right after World War II. So um, what cat if this were being drafted today, what categories do you think ought to be in there? in terms of grounds for asylum, in addition to race, religion, political opinion? I think what I think. <laughs> I know what you <laughs> Well, I mean, I think if, if you were, say, to even look at what the actually means, like in this country, the Equality Act and what are the protective characteristics, and you can identify the ones that are, that are obviously missing. Right. Okay, so uh, yeah, Ruby's absolutely right. There's many additional categories that could have been included, weren't, because they were not on the minds of the folks who drafted this in 1951. But um, folks who fit into that category have generally been subsumed into members of a particular social group over time, right? That's the most elastic of, of the categories. Including survivors of trafficking and domestic violence, a absolutely. right? That's, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, right. Because um, there's because no, right because sex is not there exactly right. Um, and, but the other thing that's crucial about this definition, so one of the main limitations of the international refugee law regime is that it requires individual persecution. Okay, the person has to show that 
either they had suffered some, they, they individually were persecuted, um, or they are likely to be persecuted if they return to their home country. So this excludes broader categories or broader uh, causes of persecution, such as generalized violence, uh, civil strife, uh, large-scale human rights violations, climate change. Okay? Um, and now, there's been an attempt in a couple of regions, uh, Africa and Latin America in particular, to address this limitation. Uh, oh, I can yeah. this, right? Okay. So, uh, definition. And they're actually quite similar. So, this is the OAU convention, Refugee Convention of 1969. Um, which added external aggression, occupation, foreign domination, or events seriously disturbing public order to that narrower uh, refugee definition. And similarly, the Cartagena Declaration of 1984, which is, was agreed to by most countries in Latin America, um, did something similar, broadened the definition of refugee to include those who are threatened by general violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, massive violation of human rights, or other circumstances which have seriously disturbed public order. Quite broad. Problem is neither of these are, are really ever enforced. They're aspirational. Um, they may have been uh, agreed to to make countries uh, feel good about themselves. But it's, very, it's been very rare for individuals seeking asylum in any countries in these regions to be granted refugee status according to any of these categories. So um, the conclusion is that the international refugee law regime is very weak. There's no international enforcement. Um, in contrast to most other human rights treaties, like the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights or the Convention Against Torture, there's no international body to enforce refugee law, to tell countries that they've erred when they um, uh, denied asylum to someone for, for uh, any, any particular reason. Yeah? Isn't that what Okay. Well, that was my next point. Uh, the UN, <laughs> UNHCR may be, have we go meant to, your to next be. Slide? Have meant to, no, no, it's not a slide, but it may have meant to be that, but it doesn't enforce it because what it, it's more of a, it has a consulting role. It can push and it, 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 it uh, issues advisories and memos to encourage countries to do uh, certain things in implementing refugee law, but they they, they, um, they don't have a body to um, hear appeals from, um, uh, from national courts. And, and of course, they serve at the pleasure of the countries uh, where they're operating. So it's a very politically sensitive role that they take. So I think you're right that that may have been the idea that they would have more of an enforcement role, but um, it's more guidance and maybe some nudging and pushing, but they have, they have to be very careful. So. Um, so international inf interna enforcement on an international level is quite weak. Um, <clears throat> again, we have the emphasis on individual persecution as opposed to group-based factors. And you have many governments who are either unwilling or unable to enforce refugee law. So the, the Refugee Convention has been incorporated, or the definition, not the whole convention, but, the, but that definition has been incorporated into domestic law. And so... Um, people can uh, try to enforce it within domestic courts. Um, but the problem is that many, many countries um, interpret it very, very narrowly. So for example, in, in the United States, particularly under the Trump administration, it's virtually impossible to get asylum on the, on the grounds of domestic violence. There was a bit of an opening under Obama that got shut down, uh, closed under Trump. Maybe there's a, it may be opening a bit under Biden. But um, uh, but many governments uh, are, take a very narrow view and are doing so more and more because of another factor, uh, which is xenophobia, which is, of course, intensifying uh, around the world. Lauren's going to talk about this with respect to South Africa in particular. So given these limitations, what some lawyers have done in some countries is um, try to utilize the constitutionalization of human rights law as it applies to refugees and asylum seekers. And what do I mean by that? Because this is the subject of research that I've been doing. Um, uh, no, not yet. Uh, for, for, a, for, for a couple of years. Um, I'm eager. I know. I know, what's I know. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, 
I don't want people to get distracted. No, no. What's on the next one? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so this is research towards a, a book that will um, be coming out from Oxford University Press uh, later this year, where I looked at five countries, lawyers in five countries, um, Colombia, Mexico, South Africa, Uganda, and the United States, and how they have attempted to utilize constitutionalized human rights on behalf of refugees. And human rights law gets constitutionalized primarily in two different ways. One is an individual human rights provision, let's say something in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, will be in a sense, cut and pasted from that treaty into uh, a country's national constitution. The far more broader way that this happens is countries will incorporate entire treaties that that country has ratified or signed or otherwise agreed to. They'll incorporate the entire treaty into their constitution. Theoretically, this makes those international treaties very strong because they, they're not just these international treaties out there that countries are free to ignore even though they've signed them and ratified them. They become part of the highest law of the land. Um, and so that's what the lawyers um, that I interviewed for, for this project uh, are trying to do. I, I selected those five countries because each is a major refugee receiving uh, country. Um, Uganda and Colombia, I believe, are numbers two and three in terms of hosting refugees now. Colombia, of course, has risen to near the top because of the surge in migration from Venezuela over the last five or six years. Uh, but they're all major refugee receiving nations. They all have national constitutions, which contain a, a, a varying number of human rights provisions. There are, for example, many such provisions in the constitutions of Colombia and Mexico, far fewer in in the United States. Uh, and each of the countries has a group of lawyers who represent refugees and are utilizing these uh, human rights provisions in constitutions uh, on their behalf. In some countries, there are thousands of such lawyers in the United States. In other countries, Uganda, there's a handful, okay? but they're all dedicated to that, to that same cause. It's interesting in a way where the country with the, the most lawyers is arguing about the fewest, in the United States is arguing about the fewest number of rights in the constitution. <laughs> so, but any, in any event. Um, so uh, the research, in the research I interviewed lawyer, uh, many, many lawyers in each of these countries, uh, just as the pandemic hit, which actually uh, uh, helped the research because suddenly all these people were at home with nothing much else to do and it was easy to interview them because they, you know, they couldn't, they had a harder time. Uh, turning me down, so it, it, made, it made it made the research uh, move along more quickly, uh, and so I, I obviously don't have time today to go into each of the countries, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about some some uniformity that I saw across the country that I thought the countries that I thought was interesting. One about the tactics that, the tactics that they use, and then the other about some some overall patterns. So some of the tactics. Um, and, and, and the terminology uh, was similar in a lot of the countries. They uh, the lawyers talked about going after the low-hanging fruit. In other words, through, and this is usually through strategic litigation, where you try to establish the fact that refugees and asylum seekers are entitled to constitutional rights at all. Because in a lot of countries, Colombia, Mexico, Uganda, these are not well well accepted um, uh, concepts. South Africa as when well. South Africa now it's a well established concept, but in the, in the period you know immediately after the fall of apartheid, not so much. Um, and so you start with those cases, and then you get a little bit more um, not necessarily a little more creative in the in, in in the kinds of rights you're trying to establish. So in a sense, the low hanging fruit is like Hannah Arendt: the right to have rights. And then you go beyond that to figure out, well, what are the substantive rights we're talking about? Uh, another theme that was really interesting was that the lawyers felt like they had to spend a lot of time educating judges. And again, this goes back to the fact that um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers, just the notion that they have rights is, is new in a lot of places. And so in, in many instances, they felt that, that part of their job in bringing these lawsuits was to educate the judges. So even if they lose occasionally, at least they put the issue on the table. At least they make the judges start to think about this. Um, Uganda is an interesting, an exception to the methodology. They, they absolutely believe, uh, believe in the education of judges, but in Uganda, it can be very dangerous uh, 
to file lawsuits against the government, challenging government policy. I mean, physically dangerous or, or, or the, the, the organization can be, can be shut down. And so there it's more collaborative in, in that they engage in training sessions uh, with judges and other government officials. Um, a third common strategy, uh, using sympathetic clients. So when the lawyers have the opportunity, they will, um, at, in terms of choosing the kinds of cases to, to work on to establish important principles um, of human rights for refugees, they will try and focus on sympathetic clients, and that typically means women and children. Um, and you saw this again and again in some of the, the key cases that um, another um, uh, theme was what, what a lot of lawyers call the human rights cocktail. In other words, you put a lot of human rights provisions together, and not that you throw them against the wall and see which ones the judge will, the judges will, which ones will stick, but there's a little bit of that, but also sort of creative use of these. And I think this was particularly true in South Africa, where there's a right to dignity in the Constitution, which has been used quite effectively. So, for example, in the in the case establishing the right to work for for asylum seekers and refugees, the the uh, the lawyers asserted, the judges agreed that having having gainful employment is a is a measure of human dignity, and and refusing that uh, or pro prohibiting refugees or asylum seekers from obtaining work is a violation of their of their right to dignity. Um, the lawyers talked about focusing on rights that are uh, um, eligible or all, all persons within the country are eligible for. So try not to focus too much on things only for refugees, but again, things like health care, education, employment, um, that, that, are, that everyone in the country is entitled to, citizens, uh, obviously. And then so, so uh, people can understand or sympathize with the need for refugees to enjoy those rights, as opposed to litigation over, for example, the definition of a refugee and what these terms actually mean. Um, people are going to be less sympathetic to those kinds of cases. Uh, another common theme is the need to frame the narrative. And this gets to the, um, the, the, the xenophobia, um, which uh, is often exploited by politicians and government officials. Um, and so lawyers in pretty much all of the countries talked about how much time they spend framing the narrative or telling the stories of their clients because of the negative perception of uh, migrants throughout um, uh, throughout uh, the cultures and how and and, and the um, uh, inability of a refusal of people to uh, distinguish between categories of, uh, of migrants, economic migrants versus refugees versus trafficking survivors, et cetera. Um, and then finally, uh, the strategy, one of the strategies was to avoid any cases that implicate national security. Because of course, part of the anti-immigrant animus that has emerged over the past decade or so has to do with threats to na or perceived threats to national security and public safety that immigrants um, uh, present. And so any cases um, that hint of that or where the government can make an argue about, uh, argument about that are going to be more um, uh, difficult for the lawyers rep representing refugees to prevail. So they, they, that's why, again, why focusing on social and cultural rights, healthcare, housing, et cetera, uh, are not necessarily easy to win, but, but easier to win than cases that involve national security issues. Now, you don't always get to, to select your clients. You don't always get to select the nature of the case that, that, um, that is, is, is presented. But to the extent that the lawyers have uh, the ability to choose, this is, these are some of the things they focus on. So um, now I'm going to switch the slide. Um, and so what I found through the course of the interviews is a, something of a continuum along which uh, the lawyers, the refugee lawyers, uh, travel in their representation of refugees. And it's a four-stage continuum. The first is, in a sense, the easiest to achieve, which is the mobilization of the lawyers themselves. That is. Uh, a, a group of lawyers 
who are dedicated to the cause of uh, refugee rights. Um, sometimes quite consciously so, and they work together and they work on strategic litigation uh, together, deciding which kinds of cases should be brought and who's going to bring them. So all the countries in, in, in the study had achieved that part uh, of the spectrum. Secondly, the low-hanging fruit, the right to have rights. Uh, and interestingly, interestingly, I think, of the, f of the five countries, really only um, South Africa, the United States, and Colombia have gotten to that stage. That is where at least the highest court in the country has recognized that refugees and asylum seekers are entitled to rights. Uh, Mexico actually has not quite gotten there. The Mexican Supreme Court has not made that determination. Now, they haven't said no, but a, a case to establish that has not reached um, the Mexican Supreme Court. And Uganda, for the reasons I talked about earlier, there's reticence to, to um, bring cases or challenging government policy in this area. The third stage is then expanding the scope of those rights. Now, there's one, once you establish the principle that, that refugees are entitled to rights, what, is that, what does that mean exactly? And so that's why in South Africa in particular, you have several decisions from the Constitutional Court in particular, establishing rights to work, uh, rights to education, et cetera. Colombia, not as far along in that process uh, because the Venezuelan migration, at least in, in large numbers, is quite recent. But, but there the Constitutional Court uh, not long ago ruled that um, refugees and asylum seekers are entitled to health care. The United States uh, actually has recognized uh, due process rights for um, non-citizens for a century and a half, but those are very limited. That's mostly about getting a hearing before the U.S. government's going to deport you. Right? Um, and, and those rights are being interpreted more and more narrowly, particularly with the, with the more conservative judiciary in, in, uh, in the U.S. And the fourth stage, the most problematic, is effective implementation of those rights. And this, this is where I'm going to transition to Lauren, because um, the, the frustration voiced by pretty much every lawyer I talked to was, we may have great rights in our Constitution, or at least some rights in our kind of human rights in our Constitution um, in, in South Africa, in particular Colombia, somewhat in the US. You know, we've got some good decisions by the highest courts about um, the entitlement to those rights for refugees and asylum seekers. The problem is the governmental agencies tasked with implementing those rights either openly refuse to do so, in the case of South Africa and the Department of, of Home Affairs, or um, have insufficient and or have insufficient resources. This would be true in, in, in the case of Colombia. Um, uh, so uh, and and the lawyers certainly and the lawyers I interviewed certainly recognizes that have recognized that that's a, a serious problem and they see the limitations of um, of not just the international refugee law uh, regime but also of this these efforts to um, utilize constitutionalized human rights on the, on behalf of refugees it's gotten you know things it's moved things along I think in, in a positive direction but but there are a lot of limitations and that I think um, compels the need for a discussion about well maybe we should look at some other avenue all right um, since I myself forgot to hold my <laughs> Can I just put it here? Will that be close enough? All right. Will I be able to advance uh, this? Okay. I'll just. No, I can see it enough on the screen to remind me. It's it's very visual. There's not a. Yeah. So I knew I was going to be last, so I thought I'd show lots of pictures. <laughs> lots, lots of pictures and try to keep it live. Let me also introduce myself, but first, thank Allison and, of course, Stephen for the presentations and all of you for, for coming. Uh, I am um, Lauren Landau. I'm with the Department of International Development here uh, at Oxford, but also with Witts University in Johannesburg. I divide my time under normal circumstances. I haven't been able to do that much in the last few years. Um, but that's, that's scientist by training, uh, although I often tell people I'm a recovering political scientist, <laughs> trying to get over it and, and turning much more to 
what I might call political geography and, and around migration. It's obvious why geography matters, but I think also when we talk about human rights. And, and you said there's not a lot of debates. I think in migration studies, migration and rights, I think one of the big sort of trends, uh, which has been a trend across the, the sort of social science, is really this sort of spatial turn. And that has also affected the discussion of uh, migrant rights. And how do we think about rights? If they're not universal, as Arendt reminds us, right, then they are spatialized. They are conditional. They are contextual. They are rights that can be claimed differently in different places. And, and so what I'll talk about today is, is how that works at, at sort of See if it does. It's not a. Is, is this because there something's gone. All right. So the fonts changed size, so it's not quite as snazzy as it was, but it, it's it's fine. Snazzy. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, at one level, the sort of spatial element here, and and I think my conclusions, I'll just to foreground this, in some ways, very much echo what Steve said, but coming from a very different sort of roundabout way to getting there. So the questions on, on sort of solidarities and reframing and, and sort of strategic action very much uh, inform where I've come. And, and I've been working, I should have said more, in South Africa for 20 years. I'm not South African. I'm another white American, just to complete the trifecta here. Um, you know, and, and, but I've been there for 20 years. Uh, and, and as a scholar, but also very involved in something called the Consortium for Refugee and Migrant in South Africa, which is a sort of umbrella group. Uh, working with uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism and Xenophobia at multiple occasions. And so quite activist by scholarly standards, I think, especially by Oxford scholarly standards, but um, not an activist per se, not, and not a practitioner in the way that Steve is with, with the clinic where I'm working on, on cases. Um, I don't think I have the, the courage or the st stamina or the, the mental strength to do that kind of work. So I'm a, a, set, a step back. But anyway, one of the things that I think, you know, the sort of first spatial story here is that much of the theorization around rights, obviously rights generally come out of a history of, of the French and the American Revolution and the British Enlightenment thinking. And they do not necessarily travel so well philosophically to other places. People like Abdullahi Anaim has argued that there are kind of cognates that you'll find in most cultures that if you want to salvage rights, but... You know, that language doesn't always travel, the philosophy, and certainly the theory of rights and how it's practiced, how they're claimed, continues to be dominated, I think, by where most of the scholars are and where most of the scholars publish. So places like this, places like the United States or in Europe. South Africa does its part in thinking about rights, and that's, I think, really important. Um, but if you look at this map, you can see where a lot of the migrants are and a lot of the theorization, the research, and the kind of thinking about rights and rights claiming is not coming from where most of those migrants are, right? And so part of what we need to do is start thinking about the specific sorts of spaces where migrants uh, find themselves. And, and let's see if this does work. Nope, I think just, <laughs> sorry, Alison. So I'll, I'm going to talk about two, um, two levels, and this is based on my own work. There are many other sort of scales that we can, and spaces in which we can think about this. The first is really to think about cities, right? So we, we talk about migrants. What we've heard about today is almost exclusively international migrants. Um, in multi-ethnic societies, which are quite divided, domestic migration is often as significant as international migration in the sense that you're crossing social boundaries. You may be crossing religious or cultural boundaries, which are can really do being as discriminated as if you travel internationally. In, in southern Congo, for example, people coming in from Zambia, who are the same ethnic group as the local population in Lubumbashi, have typically been welcomed, while citizens from other parts of the country have repeatedly been thrown out of the city in as, as interlopers, as people who are not welcome there. Right, And so, one, we need to, to kind of think about domestic migrants. And we have to also think about when people move, they don't move to a country. They do in a legal sense, right? You, you get a stamp in your passport and you've entered the UK or South Africa or Mexico, wherever. But you don't live in a country, you live in a place. And that place is increasingly an urban place. And so that's part of what I want to talk about, what rights claiming looks like in those spaces. The second sort of scale I'll talk about, and uh, I'll do both of these very cursorily, so don't worry, we won't be here all night, although 
if you want to, we could stay, um, is, is really about sort of African's place in the world. And this is particularly to look at what the European Union is doing to try to keep, well, not Africans in the world, really Africans out of the world, right? To keep Africans in, in Africa, right? And so it's repositioning Africa as an idea, as a concept, as a continent in a, in a sort of global space. So let me move on. Yeah, let's go. All right, so here is the urban, right? And, and so when we think about people living in cities and we think about, and this is this sort of big debate in migration studies about the localization, when, and we're increasingly seeing local governments getting involved. You have Berlin, Bogota, we're going to have um, Boston, all Bs, but also the cities without, that don't begin with B, getting really involved in, in discussions about what should we do, how do we promote migrant rights, etc. We don't see that at all across um, much of Africa. If anything, municipalities are anti-migrant, and they're anti-domestic migrant because they don't want them, and they're anti-immigrant. Um, of course, the elite and the whatever, they can come, they can bring their money, their resources, that's a global discourse. But we don't want more poor people. We can't deal with the poor people we have. And we certainly don't want refugees and others coming, going to make things more complicated and make our, our planning harder. Right? And you can see this is where the world's majority of migrants are and the world's majority of refugees. So we, we all know the pictures of refugee camps. They are giant and they're horrible. But that's a minority of people who are displaced, whether it's by climate, by war, by persecution, by trafficking, whatever. They tend to end up in cities, right? And so we need to think a bit more about the institutional structures at that level that work for or against rights. So can I move on? Right, so I want to show you one city. This is Gauteng. This is actually a province, but it's really an urban province, the smallest province in, in South Africa. It has about what is it, 3% of the land mass, but something like 20, 30% of the population. Uh, it's very densely populated, and you can see it's also extraordinarily multilingual. If you look at the population of Gauteng, as a, if it's one city, 50% of its population was born somewhere else, right? And only about 10% born outside of the country. But in the neighborhoods where migrants go, where refugees or migrants typically settle, international ones, they are typically moving into the same neighborhoods where you have other domestic migrants. And so this whole language of the host, of welcome, the sort of, philosoph uh, sort of philosophical foundations of uh, kind of hospitality stop, to make, stop making a lot of sense, right? And claiming from a stable institution being allowed into a community where people are living is often not a community itself. It's often a collection of people Multilingual coming from multiple places, going in multiple directions, in spaces that are often very loosely controlled by the state, right? So part of that urban sprawl I was suggesting was that you're seeing people living in the peripheries or in inner cities, in buildings that are not regulated, in towns where there are no police stations, or towns where the police are afraid to actually go, right? So you can already see what the limits of legal protection is going to get you in a space if the law itself doesn't extend practically into the environments where people are living, working, and trying to make their lives. So we can go on to that, right? And I think this is what we see across South Africa, and this is from a project I've been involved with called Xenowatch, which is tracking xenophobic violence mm -hmm. against foreigners, right? And so the crudest of rights violation, actual physical violation of someone's um, body, this is not mapping all the other myriad forms of discrimination people face in terms of access to education, health care, whatever. Uh, this is violence, often very deadly violence. Um, and what we see from this is that these people often use a language of rights, a language of state sovereignty, but the moves are almost completely horizontal. It is your neighbor that decides whether you can stay or whether you must leave. It is local politicians fighting localized battles, sometimes in connection with national movements, that are deciding this is, it's okay to be here or it's not. And the kind of rationales they use are often also highly localized. Sometimes they don't care. It depends what country you come from, comes from what language, what religion. Certainly if you're, if you're gay, if you're a lesbian, if you're whatever, drug dealer, no, definitely not allowed. But other groups may or may not be allowed in, right? And, and that varies across uh, space. Right. Move on. And so what we've seen, though, is these sort of mass mobilizations, anti-immigrant mobilizations, 
often saying that they are enforcing the law. They're enforcing the immigration laws that the state won't do. But of course, without real reference to the law, uh, except that there is a sort of sovereign right of states to control immigration. And that's often what they're doing. You don't see it so much in this image, or that image, I guess, for you. Um, they wear kind of military style police uniforms, and they're sort of appropriating the law for themselves and decide they're doing workplace inspections, they're going to the door, they are killing people in the street, right? And so it is that kind of actors that we're dealing with, actors who intimidate the police, who work outside of the law and who the state, and this is in South Africa, which by African standards is a pretty strong legal system, right? And, and police so can move on, right? What we see when we start to look at, and this I think gets to sort of what Steve was talking about, about reframing, is that a lot of the people involved in these struggles, these anti-immigrant struggles, don't, some of them see it as enforcing the law, but a lot of the people that we see, see it actually as a human rights issue, as a social justice issue, about claiming what they're entitled to get. And in South Africa, it's very clear, there's constitutional promises, there was, we're over apartheid now, things are going to get better, and they haven't. Unemployment is worse, inequality is worse, violence is as bad as it's ever been. And what happens in people's mind is they blame the foreigners for this. There's a framing there. And as you can see from this quote, this comes from a, a book we did, which you can see in the upper corner there. There's a sense, and she was an anti-apartheid activist. She would describe herself as a social justice activist. She would say that she believes in human rights, and yet very clearly is also deeply xenophobic, right? And it is that kind of sentiment which legitimizes those sorts of movements, right? And, and makes them possible and in some sense makes them necessary in people's minds. So if we can't get rid of these people, we cannot advance and we cannot claim our rights. And so it's that sort of sense of competing, which I think has been a real, uh, a real issue. Can we move on? I think that's the, so there's, okay, here it comes, right. So I think when we, when we start to think about these kind of spaces, the cities, we're looking at a kind of institutional fragmentation. Fragmentation implies it was once coherent. It is a, a polycentric kind of institutional where rights are claimed and, and mentioned, defined at, at multiple scales. In these sorts of spaces, calling people out as refugees, as migrants, asking them to mobilize as such is really a bad idea, right? It attracts attention to the debate. It frames their outsider status. It may get them legal protection, and a lot of these people who are being attacked have documents saying the state allows us to be here, but the people won't allow it because they don't respect the state's authority in that sense. And so we have to be very careful with how we frame. Right? The second, I'll move on then, um, I think, to the European Union. Is it coming? Here we go. Right? And is this sort of effort of the European Union to keep Africans out? Of course, here we are familiar with the Rwanda deal, sort of has to be mentioned, of course, but that is one of, of many sort of steps that's happened, especially since 2015 and the European migration crisis, in which Europe has increasingly sought to not just put Africans out of Europe, but really to put them out of any kind of global time, global space, and global law, right? And so it is an effort to try to emplace them and to, to say that you can only claim rights, you can only claim your future where you are now, right? And so to immobilize people at a kind of global scale. And, and uh, yes, please. Right? And, and part of the way in which they're doing this, oddly, is through the most recent, it's not law, it doesn't have legal status, right? But the Global Compact on Migration, right? Which is as close to a kind of global governance framework as we have. And as you can see, the first few things there are to collect lots of information on everybody out there, right? So it's not just the CCTV cameras we have in every corner here, but it is a huge apparatus of research to understand who these people are, why they might move, what information we could give them to stop them from moving, right? And this language of addressing root causes, which has been used to basically say, well, if we can give you some development aid, then you have no reason to move, right? We're going to educate your children so you don't have to come here and say you want schools, right? We're going to put some uh, energy into law enforcement and so you, can, you can't come and tell us it's not safe in your country, right? And so this is the language that they've been using to say, to delegitimize even the idea that you have to move, 
and to really think about how do we intervene and where do we intervene so that we can delegitimize you further for when you move that you have no claim. Um, I think there's this, is this, is this the row border thing? Yes, and some of this has in, meant investing in gigantic kind of surveillance infrastructures, including, as you can see here, this is from the European Union webpage. This is not like something they're trying to hide, right? This is something that they're proud of, a swarm of autonomous robots, right, to fly over um, different places and to track people, right? And I'm speaking to European Union intervention. It's part of this tracking is, yes, so we can see, we can use all the satellite images, we can use to see where people might move from, and we can intervene early with development projects. And if that doesn't work, they will use what they call kinetic interventions, which is a language taken straight out of the military, which is about intervening in the, the caravans, but using the language of stopping smuggling, which they have now in these documents in the EU uh, pact on migration. Smuggling is the same as trafficking, right? It's been, it has been brought together, and anyone who is involved in smuggling is a trafficker, and so anyone who has, for example, paid to get a passport, because you can't get one without a bribe in most African countries, is now a trafficker, right? And so you are criminalized, and as such, you can be stopped because no one wants criminals come into their country, right? And so there's this elaborate apparatus which is putting people outside of any kind of even ability to claim rights, right? All right. It's, I told you to be excited. It's not necessarily uplifting, right? Um, <laughs> You know, and, and you can see this is, so this is a quote from, from, I guess it's the end of 2019, 2020, I can't remember when this report, 2020, last year, two years ago, you know, about the way in which this is working and all of this kind of AI and technology is being used to code people, to emplace them, and to feed into a massive project to try to keep people from not just moving, but from even thinking about it, right? It's going to end, they include education programs, they're in schools, they're having clubs, anti-immigration clubs, right? Where, you know, where they go into schools. It's a bit like when I was growing up, you know, they had the, they, they wanted you to take an oath to write, to remain celibate until marriage. They're basically doing the same thing with migration. Yes. Yeah, a pledge, pledge, a virginity yes. pledge. It's the same kind of thing in schools across Africa that my, moving is bad, moving is a violation. You're, you're abandoning your family, you're abandoning your country. And if you come, we will send you back. Right. And, and so this I and mean, something the U.S. is doing, it's something the Australians are doing. The Europeans, I think, are a bit more sophisticated in it, but they're doing it, too. <laughs> All right. So I think that's kind of. Um, yeah, um, let's let, we can kind of skip this. Right. Well, this is this is sort of my joke. Right. So this is part of what they're doing. And, and those of you who've seen Minority Report, maybe the only good Tom Cruise movie out there, um, you know, it, it's a it's a kind of what I've been calling chronoscopy, right? They're trying to look into future and they're trying to stop Africans from, from committing crime because moving, what's required to move in Africa will almost necessarily involve smuggling and trafficking. And so we want to, for your own protection, we want you to stop, not be a criminal. And so we want you to stay in place, right? And with this kind of language, you know, it completely shifts the idea that you are a human, you have rights, you have rights to due process. As soon as you move, you're already criminalized even before you've, you've stepped out of your country, right? And so the ability to then claim rights as an asylum seeker or refugee becomes very, very hard. Okay, so I think this is where I get to the end. And this is basically telling you what Stephen already told you, right? Which is the first thing is to recognize that in this sort of spaces where most migrants are living, domestic migrants, international migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, we're not winning. Right? We're losing the battle here. We're losing across Europe. We've lost, I think, a lot in the U.S. Got a little hope back, but not a lot. But, you know, it's certainly in South Africa, which has, where I've been working, great constitution, all these sort of court cases, the government no longer adheres to what the court tells them to do, let alone the citizenry. Right? And so we're not winning with the strategies that we've had, and we're not winning with the language that we have of migrant rights, of centering migration, of this kind of migrants are people too, so they should have human rights. Obviously, we believe that. I believe that. But it's not getting traction, right? And I think we need to decenter the migrant narrative. Uh, it's very hard for a migrant rights organization whose funding depends on centering the migrant narrative and migrant vulnerability. 
but we need to think about different kinds of, of strategies. And as Stephen was saying, is thinking about moving from people to place. How do we improve these spaces so that people are not competing, whether that's through urban planning, through local regulation? How do we think about uh, investing in schools so that they might have incentives to bring in migrants and others? How do we think about investing in security systems so there's, we shift those incentives without necessarily talking about migration, certainly without talking about international migration? And I think we need new allies, right? One of the strongest allies I think we've seen fighting some of the securitization debates have been ex-military people, right? Have been police who are talking about how what they're doing on the border does nothing to stop people. It creates corruption. It creates violence. Those are voices that can speak to the right in ways that none of us probably in this room can, right? That, and, we, and oddly, those are the sorts of allies we need. We need business people. We need chambers of commerce. We need other groups who in the past might have been anti-immigrant or might associate often with social causes that might be anti-immigrant. But mobilizing them can shift that narrative so we don't see migrants as a threat even before they arrive. So that's my two cents, two pounds. I don't know. It was a lot probably for 15, 20 minutes. So thanks. I look forward to the conversation.